we all know what it's like to have a dream while we're sleeping. And we also know what it's like to wake up from the dream. And if we remember the dream, it fades from us slowly. And we also know that it's not anything that actually happened to us. Many mystics talk about our waking state as being very similar to our dream state. We go through a interaction of our mind and all of the sensual, sensual perceptions that we have and our elemental surroundings. And we are driven by this mind perception that perceives everything that's around us. This mind has a very, very powerful connection to the elements that it interacts with, to the elements that it sees. It's almost like a magnetic pull. The elements pull the mind towards it and the mind responds to the elements. And this is an ongoing scenario that doesn't stop. As a matter of fact, many people don't even realize that they are driven by their mind and they have very little involvement in trying to control it or to make it go in particular ways. No, gnosis, or the Gnostic understanding of things, is an attempt to understand the relationship between God and man. And in the Gnostic understanding of things, it is understood that in order to pass over this illusory life that we live, in order to pass over this ocean of illusion that we swim in and that we interact in, we have to become in control of our mind. Our mind is not who we are, yet our mind controls us by way of our acknowledging its recommendations and moving along with them through this path of life. So what is it that we have to do in order to become the ones who control our mind as opposed to being controlled by our mind? And what my sheikh tells us to do is that in the same way that when you ride a horse, you have to hold on to reins in order to guide it and to control it, you have to have reins to control your mind and you have to ride above it. So the word transcend is really, in this case, almost quite literal. You have to transcend your mind. You have to go higher than your mind. You have to control your mind. And what are these reins that control your mind? They are a very strong belief system in Allah, a very strong belief in the fact that Allah exists, and certitude in this belief system. So you have to have the belief system and you have to have the certitude in this belief system and they become the two reins with which you control your mind. Now, what does it mean to have a powerful belief system and what does it mean to have certitude in it 
And how does this, in fact, control your mind? Well, the mind is not capable of knowing God. The mind is capable of interacting with the physical world. So if we want to get outside of the physical world, we have to stop reacting to the part of us that reacts to the physical world. We have to stop the interface between ourselves and the part of us that is interfacing with the physical world. We have to stop taking our signals from our mind, which tells us what to do in the physical world, how to conquer the physical world, how to manipulate the physical world, how to be in the physical world, how to stop being magnetized by the physical world. And what does the belief system do? The belief system tells you this physical world is illusory. It is a temporary manifestation that we go through. However, there is an eternal life available for us. And this eternal life is different than our interaction with this physical world. This understanding is called wisdom. And when wisdom dawns within us, when wisdom rises within us, as we watch our physical mind interact with the physical world, we then can make judgment as to its importance, as to its reality, and as to whether we should be following it or not. Now, lust is the need within us for some kind of physical interaction with the world. And lust isn't um, just about sex. It's about any strong desire that we have, that we feel, that we feel we need to somehow fulfill, that we feel we somehow have to um, find a solution to, we have to get a release from. So if you are driven by a specific desire that won't allow you to find peace until you resolve it, you are caught within the grip of the mind. You are caught within the mind's control of you to force you to do certain things. Now, if you have some wisdom, and if you've been taught a little about reality, you've been taught that <clears throat> any of these physical-based desires that you think you need to fulfill in order to find peace are a lie. Because peace can't be found in the physical world. So if your belief system is strong and your conviction is certain in that belief system, when these ideas come up in the mind as to what you have to do, you should be powerful enough to overcome them through your reasoning, through your wisdom. So your reins that hold in the mind from taking control over you allow you to take control over the mind. And then the question is, who are you? And this is, of course, the question we should always be asking. Who am I? And who you are is deeper than your mind. It is an area within your heart where the truth of you exists, where Allah exists, where your soul exists, 
<clears throat> where all of the prophets exist, where all of the ketubs exist, where the holy men exist, they all exist within your heart. And if you can get in touch with that, and you are cognizant that there is a layer within you that's higher than your mind, you will be able to focus on that. So as our mind pulls us, and as our mind takes us in certain directions, we have to pull on the reins of faith and certitude through our knowledge of Gnosis, the understanding of where God is, and bring ourselves out of the influence of that lower self. That is what transcendence is. That is what is coming out of the control of your elemental mind and entering into an understanding of haq, reality. Haq is an Arabic word that means reality, God's reality. So as we begin to understand this, our life can begin to change. As we begin to understand this, we can bring new insight new understanding into our life, and more and more knowledge of reality. Now, when we get knowledge of reality, we have to act on that knowledge of reality. It's not enough just to be able to recite certain facts. It's not enough just to be able to recite that which is appropriate. And it all begins with the shariat. We have to know what's right and wrong. We have to know what we can and cannot eat. We have to know the kinds of things we may do and we may not do. And once we have grounded ourselves in the, the, the shariat, the laws of moral behavior, then we can move further. However, if we don't ground ourselves in the rules of moral behavior, we can't go further because what it means is we don't have the discipline to control the mind. The reins are not in our hands. We've let go and we're letting the mind take us anywhere it wants. So if the mind says, eat whatever you want, we then eat whatever we want. We haven't acted on our belief system, and we haven't acted with certitude to control ourselves to become compliant within the parameters of our belief system. So we need to be able to make ourselves compliant with that which is appropriate and to make ourselves shy away from and not get involved with that which is not appropriate. There's some very simple examples. You shouldn't be drinking or taking drugs. Now that means you shouldn't be drinking or taking drugs. It doesn't mean except on Saturday night or except on Sunday evening. It means you shouldn't be drinking or taking drugs. And if you can't do that, all it means is that you are giving your mind greater, greater control over you as opposed to the holy words of the holy scriptures and the holy words of the holy people who have brought the scriptures. You, you, we, we need to put these things into that kind of a perspective. Who is it that we're listening to? Who is it that we take our direction from? The mind incorporates 
what it hears and what it sees in the world, not always with great discrimination, nor does the mind differentiate necessarily between the words of a wise man and the words of a fool. Everything comes into the mix and everything then goes into operation. Everything goes into influencing you. Um, if you don't believe it, let's talk about the last time you were at a sad movie and you started to cry. Now, what was going on, you know, wasn't really happening. It was fiction and it was going on on a screen. Yet, somehow, it was able to enter you, make an emotional connection with you, and cause great emotion within you, causing you to weep. Yet it wasn't real. Yet there you are, weeping away. What causes that? How does that happen? It happens because your mind interacts with everything that it sees that comes in front of it. And it doesn't have the kind of differentiation that can tell the difference between past, present, real, not real. All these things just go on. Wisdom is the step that begins to understand what is right and what is wrong and what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. And wisdom doesn't operate from your mind. Wisdom operates from your heart. Wisdom is beyond intellect. And we need to go beyond intellect in order to find the truth of ourselves. And in finding the truth of ourselves, we then find what our relationship to our creator is. So we again have to understand that within us, we have more than one mind. We have a mind that runs on its own, that is undisciplined, and that does, isn't obedient to the will of our creator or the will of the holy scriptures or the will of the holy men that we've met in our life. We have this wild intellect within us that can go in almost any direction. We have to get control of it because not only will it go in any direction, it is magnetically attracted to illusion in the same way that a magnet and steel are attracted to each other. So parts of us are attracted to illusion. They just head in that direction and they do those things. So if we want to pull ourselves away from illusion, we have to transcend our mind. And how do we transcend our mind? By getting the reins of faith and certitude, belief and certitude in our hands. And when our mind is telling us things that don't meet the criteria of our belief system, we ignore them. We allow them to just pass by without paying attention to them. And this is a large part of our growth. If we are going to grow, that means we can't just listen to every listen and agree with every opinion that floats by us, every idea that floats by us. There has to be some strength in ourselves as to an understanding of what is appropriate behavior, what is inappropriate behavior, what is uh, Gnostic understandings of things, and what are illusory understanding of things. Gnostic, again, means the study of our relationship to God and how we can culminate that relationship with God, how we can create 
that relationship with God, what it is that we can do to make that relationship with God strong. And to do that, we have to create a desire within ourselves, a desire to love God, a desire to be closer to God. And this desire has to be greater than our desire to interact, interface, and respond to the illusory world that we live in. So we have to know what it is that we're chasing. We have to know what it is that the purpose of our life is. We have to make decisions about these things. We can't just roam free uh, like a chicken that goes in whatever direction it feels like going to at the moment, uh, especially if they're free range. We're not free range beings. We are confined beings who are confined to a certain way of acting and a certain way of being and a certain way of understanding. And the first part is to gather this knowledge of what it is we truly are, what it is we're supposed to be doing, and what our purpose in creation is. And then, once we've obtained this knowledge, we have to put this knowledge into action. We have to begin to go forward in that direction and move in that direction at all times. Now, there's also within wisdom, there's understandings and moderations. If you listen only to religious fanatics, you will become a fanatic and you won't understand moderation. There's a story of a great female saint who was always working on behalf of others, doing on behalf of others, and had basically devoted her life to helping others. And she had a niece who would visit her every once in a while. And this time her niece was staying with her for a couple of days. And it came time to take her niece back uh, to her home. And it was a long journey. So the saint prepared some food to take with him. And she was fasting this day. And they're gone for a couple of hours. And the niece says to the uh, saint, she says, I'm hungry. And I want to eat with my aunt. It's inappropriate to eat by myself. And I want you to eat with me. And the, uh, the saint says to her niece that she's fasting today. And therefore, she can't eat with her. Now, this saint was of such magnitude that Allah had placed two stars in the heaven, heavens in recognition of her. They continue walking, and the little girl continues to beg her aunt to eat with her. And she says, no, I'm fasting. And then she says to her, well, why can't you eat with me? Why can't you just break your fast? And she said, the, the saint said, God will become angry with me. And the little girl starts to cry. And she says, I'm very hungry, and I want you to eat with me. And so the saint uh, says, okay. And she takes out the food, and she sets it down, and they eat. And as that happens, a third star is placed in the heavens on behalf of the saint. The understanding is that in wisdom, moderation is understood. In wisdom, fanaticism is done away with. And we know that in each situation, there is a different way to respond to the situation. And not every situation can be responded to in exactly the same way. In this situation, 
it was more important that the saint eat with her niece than it was to continue with her fast. She could fast again tomorrow, which she probably did. But the point being that she was soothing the heart of the niece. We need to turn away from that egocentric mind of ours <clears throat> towards duty towards others, towards duty towards the world. And you will be able to tell when the mind is controlling you and when you are controlling the mind by looking at what the intention is that's being set. If the intention is almost entirely based on self-gratification, based on self-need, based on self-angrandizement, making ourselves bigger, then you know it's the mind at work. If our intention is to help others, to do on behalf of others, to follow Allah's will, then that means our reins are in good control and we are controlling the mind as opposed to the mind controlling us. In order for us to truly become holy, to truly understand the relationship that we have with our Lord and to increase this relationship, we need to have greater and greater control of our wandering mind, which finds no peace, which has no peace, and which doesn't travel towards peace, but in fact travels away from peace. The mind will constantly bring us into states of drama, because whenever you are trying to manipulate the material world in order for it to somehow um, satisfy you, it means that you're pulling things out of it. And whenever you're pulling things out of the world, there's usually somebody else on the other side holding on to it. So this tug of war begins to happen in the world, and that tug of war is the drama that is constantly going on in the world. And we have to find a way to release ourselves from that drama. And it's in the release of ourselves from the drama of the world. It's in the release of ourselves from the seesaw nature of what goes on in the world that we find true peace. And it's the only way that we can find true peace. And doubt is out. Doubt is one of the great tools that the mind uses in order to cause confusion within us. And the mind is incredibly facile at creating doubt within us. And that's why your belief system has to be incredibly strong and you have to have certitude in your belief system. You have to have certitude that what God has done is appropriate. You have to have certitude that what is going on in your life is appropriate. And what happens is, as you stop doubting your situation, as you learn how to accept the situation that you are in, the drama that comes from trying to alter everything, from trying to move everything, goes away. It dissipates. If you're not trying to push, there's nothing to push against. And the effort of pushing and the strain of pushing and the difficulty of pushing disappears. And when that disappears, we become in a more tranquil place. But for whatever reason, we are constantly pushing ourselves into situations that make it difficult.
for ourselves. We have to learn how to accept Allah's portion. And as we learn how to accept Allah's portion, everything else becomes easier. Now, in truth, the portions that we are given of the material world, each of us, all become irrelevant with time. So ask yourself, when is the time when these portions will become irrelevant? Will it be today? Or are we going to continue in this mode to increase our portion in the world? Is that going to become our reason for being? Is our reason for being to have more fame, to have more power, to have more wealth, to have more men, to have more women, to have more property? Is that our reason for being? Or is our reason for being to come to know Hak, reality, come to know the truth of the purpose we were created, come to know the reason that we are here and the reason for our creation. If we can understand these things, if we can know these things, we will become a different being, will become a more relaxed being. And as we become a more relaxed, peaceful being, our ability to concentrate on reality will become greater and greater and greater because we won't have all of the different ideas that we have about the world pulling us and pushing us. I'm uh, involved in various businesses and businesses have problems and something that you have to do when these problems arise is solve them now very often the people that you want to solve them with don't agree with you which causes conflict conflict causes the need for lawyers lawyers causes the need for more drama now can you can I be involved in all of these things and yet not be attached to them? You see, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. We live in the world and we do the things that we need to do in the world, but is that who we are? Is that what affects our internal state? Or can we remove ourselves even while we're doing all these things so these worldly difficulties these worldly dramas don't affect our internal state what's more important the state of our relationship with illusion or the state of our relationship with our creator it usually comes down to questions that are that simplistic yet we don't see them as that simplistic because we don't see the ability within us to release ourselves from the chains that the mind has tied us up in. If we can get to the point where we can do things without being attached, if we can do things without being overwhelmed by the drama that comes with them, we can then concentrate on our relationship with our Creator. If we can't, we can't. If we can't give of ourselves to others, how are we going to give of ourselves to our Creator? If we can't be involved with helping others, how are we going to become like our Creator? If mercy and compassion aren't part of us, how can we become like our creator? We 
are given certain understandings of who our creator is. He has no form, but he has qualities, and these qualities represent as best as we can understand what and who our creator is. Of course, he is greater than any of our understandings, but we can begin to make inroads into understanding him by understanding these qualities. Now, understanding these qualities and learning these qualities is only the first step. Bringing these qualities into action in our life is the next step. And one can't move without the other. It's like a half-hatched egg. No chicken is going to come out. The thing has to be hatched fully, and that happens through the incorporation of knowledge and action. So we have to take action as to our knowledge of truth. The reality is understood through the truth of Allah. And we have the capability of understanding the truth of Allah. And this truth is known to us through what's known as the Kalima, La ilaha illallah. Nothing exists but God, and I do not exist. Well, if I don't exist, what am I so upset about? What is causing me so much difficulty? What am I spending all this time trying to soothe my doubts? I'm not here and my doubts aren't here. None of it is here. We need to grasp this and we need to act this way. And through the Kalima, our faith strengthens in the fact that Allah is here and Allah is everywhere, and Allah takes care of everything. And through that understanding, we can then turn inwardly to begin to know ourself. And through knowing ourself, we become, we, we, we find the way to know our Lord. And this is why we were put here. God created man to know him and for him to know man. And this is the mystery within creation. And for us to get involved in that mystery, we have to leave the toys of this illusory world. We have to give up our baby life. We have to enter into our adult life. And our adult life leaves behind all the things of childhood, leaves behind all the illusions that comfort children. We face reality and we move into it. And we understand that the glory that is available through facing the truth of reality is greater than all the toys of our childhood. And we have to grasp that. We have to believe that. And we have to work on that. And we have to ask Allah to help us make that real in our life. Allah, make us thirst for reality. Make us thirst for the truth, and then quench that thirst. Ameen, ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.